Welcome back again to the Living in Faith Everyday Podcast, the Life Podcast. This is the series I've entitled 66 Books, 66 short podcasts that look at the 66 books of our Bible. And today you've reached the book of John, the Gospel of John, the book of the deity of Jesus Christ. John has been called the most wonderful of all the biblical writings by many over the years. It is thought of by many as the deepest and most profound of all the inspired writings. It is a truly beautiful book and a supreme literary work. It is one of the most beloved books in our modern Bible. Many even say it is probably the most important document in all of world literature. The author of the fourth gospel identifies himself, but not by name. In John 21 verses 19 to 24, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this phrase occurs five times throughout John's gospel. Humility suggests that when he refers to himself in the book, John never called himself by his own name. But it is worth noting that all the other gospel writers, when describing the same events, name him. Therefore the Apostle John must indeed be the author of this fourth gospel, and church tradition confirms that conclusion. The family of John lived on the shores of Lake Galilee, and he and his brother James worked with his father Zebedee as a fisherman, alongside Peter and Andrew, brothers from another local family. The Bible contains very little additional information about John's ministry. Non-biblical writings indicate that he lived to a very old age, and he spent most of his later years in and around Ephesus, from where he wrote his gospel and his letters. He is also traditionally regarded as the writer of Revelation, which means he probably spent his final years as a prisoner on the island of Patmos just off the coast of Ephesus. So who was this book written to? Who were the recipients? Scholars usually date John between 85 and 95 AD. The basic reason for doing that is that he makes no reference to the destruction of Jerusalem and that the reason for this is the destruction of Jerusalem must have occurred many years before he wrote his book. There is an early and consistent tradition that John wrote from Ephesus at the request of the church, being that they would be a summary of the oral teachings of the life of Christ. In fact, 4th century historian Eusebius refers to a current opinion at that time when he was writing that John wrote after the other evangelists in order to supply a requested account of the early period of the Lord's ministry which was not covered in detail by the other gospel accounts. So what was the message of this book? Well, churches in the region of Ephesus had long been troubled by false teaching Acts chapter 20 and Revelation chapter 2 paint that picture for us. The teaching that was causing this trouble was an early form of Gnosticism, a heresy that would become very destructive, particularly during the second century. Gnostics combined Christian belief with pagan philosophy, and they denied that there could be a union between things that appeared to be opposites. This meant that some denied that Jesus was fully human, and others were denying that he was God. John stands and firmly opposes both these errors in his writings. But his writings are more than merely a defense against false teaching. It has a positive purpose also, and that was to lead people to seek faith in Christ, so that they may experience the full and eternal life that Christ had made possible for them. The main message is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who has come to give eternal life to all who believe in him, and that he died and he was raised, and thereafter commissioned his disciples to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. The basic structure of the book of John is chronological and geographical. 
John chooses what are referred to as witnesses throughout his book to testify to the deity of the Messiahship of Jesus. So after the profound opening of the first 18 verses of chapter 1, we then have a series from chapter 119 through to the end of chapter 12 where witness accounts of the public ministry of Christ are described. Witnesses during the call of the disciples, during the commencement of his ministry, and even during the various controversies and conflicts that he faced. Then in the third section of the book, you have, from running from chapter 13 to chapter 17, you have witness accounts of the private ministry of Christ, things like the witnesses to his foot washing, and also him discussing his departure and his discussions and discourses and teaching on relationships, and even why that he would be called to leave. And there even is a, a detailed witness description of the Lord's Prayer and what it means. In the fourth section, John brings out for its witnesses to the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. We hear statement accounts and teaching on his arrest and trial, his trial before Pilate, and also witnesses to the actual crucifixion itself, and most importantly, during his resurrection appearance. It then closes with its famous epilogue in chapter 21, verses 1 to 25. So, what was the purpose of this book? Why was it written? Well, you see, not only did the Gnostics of the AD 90s have trouble accepting Jesus' uniqueness, but so did the Orthodox Jews of Jesus' day. John's method of teaching in this book is to recount the stories and teachings of Jesus, to recount the witness accounts and the stories and teachings of Jesus. He did not just recount the incidents from Jesus' life, but he shows their significance, and for this reason he calls them signs. John's signs show that not only was Jesus was the Messiah, but he was also the Son of God. The Jews of that day considered it a blasphemy that a person who had grown up among them could actually claim to be God, and as a result the signs that Jesus performed in John's account are usually followed by long debates, often with Jewish people. When John records a miracle, he treats it differently than the other gospel accounts. The other writers did little more than tell the story, whereas John often follows the story with lengthy teaching that arose out of it. Since John was concerned with the meaning and significance of events, he records some of Jesus' conversations with people at great length. For example, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and the Samaritan woman by the well in John chapter 4. In a similar way, he uses his account of the Last Supper, which the other writers record only briefly, to provide four chapters of teaching on important Christian doctrines. And again, the teaching we see comes direct from the lips of Jesus. At the centre of all these doctrinal discussions was the fact that Jesus is being presented as God in human form. Jesus' teaching on God's kingdom is shown to be in contrast to the popular Jewish belief of that time. The Jews, you see, believed that the kingdom was a future national and political kingdom that would be centred on Israel. Jesus is pointing out in these teaching that God's kingdom was already among them, and it was present in him. Those who submitted to Christ's rule thereby entered God's kingdom and thereby received the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And it also draws attention to the fact that that same truth applies to people of any era. Those who believe in Christ, whenever they do it, enter his kingdom and receive his blessing. Jesus speaks of the kingdom as being something in the future, something that would be established after his death and resurrection. But Jesus was also saying that those who were already believers now were indeed entering his kingdom. Therefore, although the kingdom of God is already present amongst them, it still awaits its completion in the future. And since the kingdom of God is in fact the rule of God, believers enter into it when they believe. But of course, they will not experience the full blessing of it until they either reach heaven or Christ returns to banish evil and reign in righteousness. 
John records all these signs that, as he puts it in John 20 verse 31, in order that they might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that by believing in him they may have life in his name. So the major purpose of John's Gospel is evangelistic with secondary purposes there to strengthen the faith of believers and urge them to become disciples. So in summary, John presents Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who came to give eternal life to all who believe in him, and that he died and was raised again and commissioned his disciples to proclaim the gift of eternal life to anyone who would trust and follow him. If Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you believe in him, you will have eternal life. If Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you can be certain that you will have that eternal life by believing in Him and that Jesus the Christ, the Son, will abide in you today.